in your gut. Um, in 2012, I discovered Laravel uh, a couple years ago. Back then, like probably most of you guys came to Laravel with version four, but back then, very different framework. Like, I don't think uh, responding to routes with controllers even existed back then. Uh, all methods were using underscores because PSR, I don't think, was a thing really at all. Uh, if you'd look in the source, you might find a dragon. You either know what that means or you have no clue. So yeah, it was a very, very different framework. Um, but there was something like, I don't know, there was something to it. It's not nearly, like back then, V2, V3, it wasn't nearly what it is today. Not, not even close. But there was, there was something there. I had like a gut feeling that, that Taylor, like so many people will, will create interesting frameworks and stuff, but you see they just put it up on GitHub and there's zero documentation. And if you ask them how to use it, they say, look at the source arrogantly, like that's, that's a good response. Taylor understood that, at least in my mind, he understood that, yes, this, the, the code is incredibly important, but it's also about developer happiness. It's also about how easy it is to use. It's also about the brand. Taylor does, I think, when it comes to frameworks and branding, he does it better than anyone, and that's incredibly important. That's not anything to knock Laravel about. So yeah, I, I just kind of had a gut feeling that this was something I wanted to invest my time into, and I think a lot of us did. Check this out. Here, um, obviously, anything past right now is a projection with Google. Who knows if that's accurate? But honestly, if I had to vote, I would say that projection is, in reality, going to be closer to 90 degrees. So it's completely exploding. The fact that there's so many people here today, a year ago, we were in a small room. There might have been 100 people. It's vastly different. The, the, the number of people here, and also the people on the waiting list that didn't get in. So it's exploding. And that's a very good thing for us. OK, let's get into it. Uh, my name's Jeffrey Way. <laughs> what, is, what is funny about Oh, OK. <laughs> I don't read my own slides. These are old. OK. Uh, I'm based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This is my wife. <laughs> this is my dog. He's much, much cooler than me. I promise we're not alcoholics. I own Laracast.com. Thank you. Um, the one person. <laughs> like, if you're going to woo everyone, do it. Don't do the one guy. <laughs> yeah! uh, I like to think of Laracast as the Netflix for your career. So, like, it's video training, but like, especially everyone in here, every video here is tailor made for you, whether you're a beginner or advanced. It's Netflix specifically for all of us. And I think that's. Cool. Um, who's, brought, who's bought me lunch before? Oh my god, thank you. That feels very good. It was a stupid thing. Like when I created the site, I was like, oh, buy me lunch. You know, just another way to say, give me money, but kind of caught on. So I was going to make shirts to hand out that said, I bought Jeffrey lunch, but then I was like, oh, it's arrogant. Let's get back to the talk. This has nothing to do with anything. Uh, you might also know me as uh, I've spoken at every Laracon conference which I'm thankful for. Uh, I've written a book called Laravel Testing Decoded. Uh, created, thank you, <laughs> one guy again. <laughs> uh, I've created lots of popular packages. Like for Laravel specifically, some of you might use Laravel 4 generators, which uh, we'll cover in this talk a little bit. Uh, I'm a recurring guest on the Laravel IO podcast. Excellent podcast. Everyone in here should listen to it uh, when you're working or working out. And before Laracast, I was the head of web development courses with Envato uh, with a product called Touch Plus. <laughs> Laracast is way better than Touch Plus, just FYI. So <laughs> don't cheer for them. Uh, OK, so my talk was called What's Wrong With It? That is not what this talk is about. That was what I said, because it can be applied to everything. Uh, in reality, I just want to show you cool stuff. It's the very first talk of the conference. Um, I don't have any specific idea to pass on. I'm not going to do anything that people will rage on uh, on Twitter. So just lots of cool, cool stuff. Think of it as like a whirlwind tour. Here's the game plan. Uh, FYI, there's no chance we're getting through all of this stuff. We'll get through maybe half. 
But yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the new stuff in 4.2, just a little. Uh, file generation, talking about facades. Everyone wants to talk about that. Form validation and cool arrays on steroids. And my favorite feature of Laravel, uh, magical object creation, which we'll talk about. And then uh, hopefully we can get to this stuff, like dealing with muddy controllers and domain events and a little bit of a testing corner. And, and then finally, some tooling that uh, I think is incredibly useful. OK, let's get started. This is new to 4.2. So uh, if you, everyone sends mail, of course, in their applications, you probably do it just with simple SMTP. Fine, no, no big problem. But with Laravel 4.2, uh, there's new drivers specifically for Mailgun and Mandrill. So specifically for stuff like uh, transactional email. When a user signs up, then send them a welcome email. When a user cancels, send them a uh, cancellation email. Uh, you can use services like Mandrill specifically for this. And now, in 4.2, it's like ridiculous, ridiculously easy to hook into this stuff. So imagine that you want to uh, work with this. Mandrill.com. Sign up, 30 seconds. You can do it for free to start. Next, Laravel makes use of Guzzle, because behind the scenes, it's not using SMTP. It's sending API requests. So uh, it uses Guzzle for that. There's a good chance you're already using this. Uh, but if not, make sure you pull that in. Next, you go to your mail configuration file. And right now, that probably says like mail or SMTP. But we're going to switch that over to Mandrill. Finally, this is new. You're going to have a new services.php configuration file. Uh, you can put any number of services here. So it's not like it's exclusive to Mandrill. So uh, this allows you to do things like config get services.mandrill, and that's going to return an array. And in this case, it just contains uh, our secret. Now, in this case, I'm using an environment variable, which I would say is a good practice. But if for whatever reason you don't want to do that, then of course you can just paste in the API key that Mandrill will give you. Will give you. Done. That's how nice it is. You're completely done. 30 seconds and you can automatically hook in. So now, just like you always do, mail send. You, know, you don't have to change any production code. And that's what's amazing about these unified uh, drivers here. It'll completely work just like it did before. So 30 seconds of configuration, and you're done. This is why I love Laravel. And now, obviously, all your emails and your transactional emails will go through Mandrill. And you can also get all this reporting stuff. How many people clicked this email? How many people opened it? How many people read it? How many people did all these other things that you'll never look at? OK, let's move on to number two. I told you, just lots of cool stuff. File generation. <clears throat> OK, so migration. Migra I, migrations, I love migrations, to say it three times. Uh, obviously, it kind of comes from Rails, but Laravel uses it uh, wonderfully. So imagine that you need to create some migration, like create a user's table. Well, Laravel has an artisan command for that. Perfect. However, it falls just short of creating the schema for you. So when you say schema create users, and then you have to say like table username, table email, table whatever, uh, fine. But if you want to automate some of that stuff, you can pull in uh, my generators package. Just require away generators, anything 2.star. So now it looks a little bit different. We're going to use generate migration. We specify a name, create users table. And now you'll pass a fields option. And so basically what we're saying here is we need an email type. Should be a string. Should be unique. We also need a password type. That should be a string, and it should be 60 characters. So now when you run this, and by the way, because that's kind of verbose, remember, like anything you type over and over, you have to create aliases for that. Be very sensitive to anything that takes more than even eight seconds. Something that takes eight seconds to write over the course of a year or your career adds up so quickly. So be very sensitive to that. Anyhow, so now you'll get the same migration file, but it will automatically populate the schema for you. Really, really cool. So that means now you can do things like this directly from the terminal. So generate migration, give it a name, give it the fields, and then immediately run migrate without ever touching your editor. Because before, which is fine, I'm not knocking it. But before, you'd create the migration, go back to your editor, edit the migration, fill in the schema, refer to the documentation to figure out what you need, then go back to the terminal, then run migrate. This way, you can do it in two commands. Now, the way this works is the name is special. So it looks for keywords. 
So before we had create users table, so create is the keyword. This time we have add username to users table, so add is the keyword. So imagine you wanna add a username to your users table. We will use the name, the fields is username string. And now this time, because we use that keyword, the package is smart enough to know, oh, we're not creating a table, we are uh, appending to a table. So it will use the correct syntax, schema, table, users. And it's also smart enough to know, okay, if you wanna reverse that, migrate, roll back, then it knows that in that case, we are dropping the column. So these things can really save you a lot of time. So create users table, another example, add username to users table. If you wanna remove, create a migration to remove the field, remove username from users table, and it'll just work. But that's not it, you can do tons of stuff. So you can generate uh, models and, and controllers and seed files and resources pretty neat. So think of like, imagine you're building just the, the obligatory task app. So in your routes file, route resource tasks, well then you have to create a controller, then you might create a model, then you'll create views. If you wanna seed your tasks, then you'll create a seed file. All of that stuff just takes up time, and we're developers, we can automate all this stuff. So if you run generate resource, in this case we're using a post as an example, it's gonna ask you a few questions. Do you want a model? Do you want views? Do you want a controller? What about migrations and the schema? Do you want a seeder? So all of this stuff, it'll just do for you automatically, and it'll save you a huge amount of time. So be sure to check that out if that sounds interesting. Next cool thing, what's behind this facade? Um, what's funny about that? Because we know on Twitter people freak out about facades and I think they're awesome. Uh, okay, so not being patronizing, but for anyone maybe newer to Laravel, uh, you're using a facade if you've ever done something like auth attempt or file get or password remind. So basically it's just kind of a little abstraction for service location. It's like think of it as like a little bit of sugar to, to make your code easier. Um, but it's not for everything and that's what people get pissed, about, pissed off about. When is it appropriate to use a facade if ever? And there would be some people that would say never. It's always a bad idea and um, you have to make up your own mind. Don't listen to me or anyone else. But here's an example of using a facade. So imagine just a simple project or something. This is in your controller. Well, validate or make, pass in your input, pass in your rules, and then return a Boolean. So this is fine. Again, like, let, let's just see real quick. Show of hands, perfectly fine. Show of hands, not good, be honest. And show of hands, it entirely depends. Everyone raise your hands. It entirely depends. Like we don't wanna follow dogma. If, if I'm building a stupid, simple blog, I don't need to create some big abstraction layer like a validation, it doesn't matter. It depends upon what you're building. Everything, it's like these little, I think of them as little tools. And for every project, you can pull out the tools that you need, and for many of these projects, you will never require that tool. So it's not like you have to force repositories and services and everything down a project's throat if it's not required. But some of you disagree. Anyhow, this does have some downsides. So if you're building something that should be a little bit more maintainable, there are some downsides to this. It's a little more difficult to unit test. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, Jeff, you can do validator should receive, and that will mock it. And yes, that's absolutely true, but that wouldn't necessarily be a unit test. If we're talking about testing in isolation, well, if you do validator should receive, it assumes the framework. It assumes a service location. So if you ever use something like PHP spec, and you're having trouble testing this, that's because, in my opinion, PHP spec is sort of nudging you in the right direction. But of course, for a simple project, you, pro you may not have tests, in which case you don't need to worry about that. That's a completely other discussion. Anyhow, let's imagine you're building something, you're gonna maintain it for a few years, you want this to be nice. Well now, you can actually inject, using dependency injection, what's underneath the facade. So in our case, if we're using validation, we can inject Illuminate Validation Factory, and there's a lookup I'll show you in a minute, uh, and then you interact with it in the exact same way. Remember, that's how facades work. So if you do validator make, yes, it's, a, it, it's completely a static method, but behind the scenes what's actually happening is a make method on a uh, validator class is actually being triggered. Okay, so this is somewhat new, maybe in the last six months, 
If you go to laravel.com slash docs slash facades, scroll to the bottom, you'll see this whole lookup table so you can figure out if I do want to inject this facade, it's not like you just inject the name of the facade in the constructor. You actually have to uh, refer to this lookup here. So like I said, benefits to that. Removes the service locator dependency. That's good for your domain. Less reliance on the framework. Plenty of people would say that's good. Easier to unit test. Lots of little advantages. But then a lot of people end up with, with this problem where they're like, when should I use facades? Should I not use them? What is the rule? And uh, like I said, it just kind of comes down to, one, your project and, and whatever you want to do. You don't have to blindly follow this stuff. But I would say facades are excellent in the HTTP layer. So like controllers, I don't worry about it too much. But in your domain, be a little more sensitive to that. I, wouldn't, I would always use injection in that case for anything related to the domain. Now though, there's plenty of people, like imagine this is your controller. There's plenty of people who would say that's bad. Don't do this. And basically the reason why they're saying that is if we call the store method, there's no way to know what store is making use of. So we know, like, okay, it's making use of input and redirect, but a lot of people would say, well, you don't know that immediately. When a controller is instantiated, you don't have this idea of what it's making use of. You don't know what its world is like. And when you sneak that stuff in, they would say that's bad. So if you wanted to, you could kind of find a way to inject uh, in this case, the redirector, as well as the request classes, but on a, like, it just kind of comes, up, comes down to what you think. When I think of maintaining my apps and the struggles I've had, this has never once been a bottleneck for me, whether I used input only. Maybe it is for you, but it's not something I'm worried about. So readability is very important, especially in the controller, and I have no problem with that whatsoever. You might disagree. So some people, not fans of it, I would say ignore it, but make up your own mind on this. OK, number four, slow down. Am I talking fast? No. Yes. Form validation. This is an interesting one. Like, every application requires form validation. The smallest blog up to the most large enterprise level application needs some level of form validation. But especially in Laravel, you find like everyone does it differently. Everybody does it differently. And that's a little surprising, like it's the most common thing in the world. So again, kind of that similar example. We grab some input, we validate it, and if it fails, go back. It's fine for small projects. I'm just not gonna complain about it too much. Or you might consider this, if it's something a little larger and you want a little more flexibility, you could create a registration form object and inject that. This doesn't have to be your controller, wherever you do this, your, your service, your application service, wherever. Now within your store method, this, you get a little bit of a readability bonus out of this. Get the registration form and validate it against the input. That's nice. But like I said, some people do it differently. Some people like to do it within their repository. I'm not a huge fan of that, but a lot of people do it. Some people will do this uh, as part of like a command bus, which we will touch on for a few minutes. Uh, so make up your own mind. Anyhow, with this example, registration form is just a simple, simple object. You specify your rules. We extend just a, a generic form validator class that will actually perform the validation for us. So now we have a dedicated form object for the form. So maybe uh, you have another form for like upgrading a subscription. Well, you could have an upgrade subscription form where you specify your rules. Now, handling validation. Everyone disagrees on this. Um, should you throw an exception for failed form validation? Plenty of people would say no. Uh, exceptions are for exceptional circumstances. And a form, or I'm sorry, validation failing isn't exceptional. It's, it's expected in some cases. Other people would disagree. Again, make up your own mind on this. There is no specific rule. I kind of think it's nice. It's helpful to me. Validate the registration form. If we have a form validation exception thrown, then go back. Or if you don't want to do this in your controller, you might do something like this. Go to your global.php file and register sort of like a, a global handler. Same thing, be a little careful with this. It sort of assumes HTTP, but make up your own mind. Again, there's a package for this or write it on your own. Very, very simple stuff. Okay, next cool thing. I call this a raise on steroids. A lot of people don't know about this. So you're using Eloquent. 
you, you fetch some records from the database. You get a collection in return, and you have all these helpful methods like first and last, all this cool stuff. It's not exclusive to your database results. It's just using a collection class. You can use it on your own. In fact, do use it. So if you're always like, I don't know about you guys, I've been doing this a long time, and when it comes to those array underscore functions, I'm always going back to the documentation. What's the order for the arguments? I have no clue. If you want to do this in more of an object-oriented way, this helps. So we have a collection class. Use it at the top. Then you can do collection make, pass in some array. Uh, or you can just instantiate collection on your own and then pass in the arguments. This is just a little bit of uh, sugar. All right, so now that's all. You can access all the same methods like you normally would. Let's get the first person in the family. Let's get, get the last. If you want to add a new person to that collection, family push. You're not having to figure out uh, what to do there if you're not using the, uh, the collection. OK, so now imagine that, like, I, I use this example. It's a terrible example. But imagine mom and dad get divorced. If you want, you might use a slice method. We're going to slice mom out. And what the slice method will do is actually return a collection. So we call slice, and that will return a new collection. Now mom can remarry the mailman, <laughs> who's 25 years old, and uh, has nothing to do. I'm very happily married. <laughs> and yeah, there's, there's so many cool methods on this. Look for yourself. The key is that this stuff is available to you, and plenty of people don't even know that they can use it outside of their database results. So use them. Next cool thing, OK. I love this. My favorite thing. I'm always championing uh, Laravel about this. Magic object creation. Taylor showed me this right around when he was working on version 4, and it blew me away. This was when I was like, OK, I'm going to invest lots of energy. OK, so you have a my class class. And my class depends on two, uh, dependency one and dependency two. Now, we know that we can do app make, and then you, and then you provide the path to the class. But have you ever thought about, like, how does Laravel do that? How does it know how to create that object? Well, it just uses PHP, the reflection API. A lot of people don't use this. And for good reason. Like, be careful using it. But Laravel uses it very wonderfully here. So I'm going to show you just kind of a, a trimmed down version of basically how Laravel accomplishes this. I've cut out just a little bit to make it easier for the slides. All right. So we create a new instance of reflection class, just a basic PHP class. Now, think of it as reflecting into the class. So now you have all these little helpful methods. Get name, which is basically the same as passing the object to get underscore class, that function. But then you also have get short name. That's helpful. If you want the name of the class minus the full namespace tree, you can use get short name. Now, these two next ones Laravel uses is instantiable. So think of that as a way of saying, is it possible to instantiate this class? And it will return a Boolean, of course. But if it's false, what does that mean? It means it's an interface or an abstract class. And as we know, of course, you can't instantiate those. Finally, get constructor. If we're going to figure out what those dependencies are, we need to be able to fetch that constructor. So here's basically what Laravel does. Reflects into the class path that you provide. And it says, is this something that I can instantiate? And if it's not, it throws a binding resolution exception. I bet everyone has seen that at one point or another working on that. So now you know when you see that, it's because Laravel's trying to help you out, but it's not a magician. You're giving it an interface. There's no binding registered yet, so it's letting you know, hey, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do right here. But let's imagine that, um, I'll go back. Let's imagine that it is instantiable. Well, next, it's going to look into that constructor. Think of it as like peeking into the constructor. Now, two things could happen here. One, null will be returned. And think about it. What would happen if null is returned when we fetch a constructor? Well, that means there is no constructor. And if there is no constructor, it's the easiest thing in the world to instantiate. So it just returns new class name, done, go eat cake. Easy. But as we know, probably there will be a constructor. So now. Again, this is a little dumbed down. What Laravel is going to do is basically filter through all of those arguments that you specify, or the parameters you specify in the constructor. And first, it's going to see basically, like, is this type hinted? Because if it is type hinted, well, here are uh, the very last line in the for each statement. It's basically going to call the make method on the container recursively. 
So that's how, like, if you ever think, think about this. You have a class that has a dependency, and that dependency has this dependency, and this dependency has that dependency. Laravel just, if it can, will magically do all of that stuff for you. So it basically is calling that make method recursively for you. Now, though, if it gets the dependency, and there basically is no type hint, no class, once again, like, Laravel doesn't know what to do. So if you have a constructor that has an argument of foo, Laravel has no idea what foo is. Either there's a default, and in real life, it would check to see, is there a default value? And if so, I'll, I'll use that. But if there's not a default, Laravel has no clue what to do, so it throws a binding resolution exception. And that's it. So finally, it builds up that dependency array. It passes that into a new instance of your object. And now you know when you do app make your class, behind the scenes, you're getting a lot of Laravel awesomeness, but also you're benefiting from the reflection API. OK, seven. A little more complicated. I have a theory that like, if you come to a new code base, a really, really good place to go is the controller. If you want to figure out how a developer or even a team approaches and thinks about their code, you can learn so much from the controller and the way they structure that. Everyone has seen an example like this at some point. So it doesn't matter what the resource, we're storing something. And this is when, like, it's completely procedural code. A lot of people do this, back in the code igniter days especially. Uh, you need to do a bunch of these things when a user signs up. So they basically just take that whole snippet of whatever has to happen and they paste it in to the store method. And again, if it's a small project, don't worry about it too much. But for anything larger, this breaks down pretty quick. So we grab some input, we validate it. If it fails, we go back. We create a user. But then when a user gets created, we need to send them a welcome email. And then maybe we have some kind of user events table where we track the events. So we do that, and then you do some more stuff, add them to a newsletter. You have all of these sequential tasks that need to happen when a user signs up. And then finally, we redirect back. And I've seen this time and time again. Because a lot of people are like, you just don't know what to do. Where am I supposed to put this stuff? But think about it, like what exactly is wrong with this? Well, clearly, it breaks the SRP, the single responsibility principle. It also violates the OCP, the open close principle. So that basically states that um, a module is open for extension. That doesn't mean inheritance, they just some kind of extension, but closed for modification. So if you talk to the business and they were to tell you, oh, by the way, when a user signs up, when they sign up, we should also do so and so. Well, you'd have to come back here, currently, you'd have to come back here and update the code. Not good. I'll show you a couple options and you can decide for yourself what you think. Here's what some people do. One option might be to create kind of a dedicated service class. So we have a user creator, and then you pass in the input. But also, we pass in a reference to the controller. So what we're doing here is basically we're breaking it down to the essentials. What are we really trying to do? We're trying to create a user. So you write it as such, and now we have these two new methods that specify how we should respond to when a user is created and when we tried to create a user but it failed. Now, again, make up your own mind on this. This is maybe how it would look. Validate the registration form, catch any form exceptions. Now this time, within your service class, you would actually call user creation fails on the listener. So that means something like your controller would adhere to an interface like this. Anything, and it doesn't have to be the controller. However you want to respond, just make sure that it implements this interface. And that's because within here, it's going to expect user creation fails and user creation succeeds to be available. So we type hint it at the top to say, I'm going to force you to implement this interface because I require it. Some people do that. Another option, if it's appropriate for your application, it's not always appropriate, decide for yourself, is to use a command. Now, don't confuse this with CQRS. It's not, we're not getting into that. Just a command class. And think of a command as a command, an order, an instruction, but specifically a readable instruction. I love this quote. Commands help you in supporting the ubiqu ubiquitous language by explicitly capturing user intent at the boundaries of the system. This is important. I'm going to show you a few quotes in this presentation, if I can get to it. And they both revolve around capturing user intent. We're so often focused on a crud style of thinking. 
create a user, create a job. But we forget that the business, they would never talk about create job. They might talk about posting a job listing, but would they ever say create job? No. So this is kind of a DDD style of thinking, making the needs and the requirements of the business match your code as best as you can. Maybe something like this would work. So we grab our input. And we call a subscribe user command, because that's what we're trying to do. We're subscribing a user. So we write it as such. Next, we pass it through a command bus. And if you're not familiar with this, this might take you aback. It did me. Give it five minutes before you decide if you like it or not. So we're going to execute this command. And here's what that might look like. Just a simple, plain old PHP object. Nothing special in there. But, and this is a lot of code, I apologize if you can't read this. Give it just a second to soak in. All right, command bus. Uh, what is a command bus? Well, we call it a bus because it basically, it kind of gets you to where you need to be. So notice that we will have a one-to-one -one relationship between a command and its associated handler class. So that means if we have a subscribe user command, then there would be an associated subscribe user command handler class. And that class would be responsible for delegating and handling the process of subscribing a user. Here's a very dumbed down version of what that could look like. Subscribe the user, save it, and then we need to dispatch events. And we may get to that in the next uh, section if we can. But basically, we still have that thing where when a user signs up, you need to send them an email, schedule an email, do newsletter, whatever has to happen, or whatever the business says you have to do when a user signs up. So we can uh, prepare that as events, which is appropriate. Now here, when we handle it, I'm just doing subscribe and save. You can do whatever is appropriate there. So we, it's kind of a cliffhanger. So let's talk about events. That's really important. I became a significantly better developer when I started really understanding how to use them. It's a simple enough concept, you know? But I don't know. It's, it's, you learn about it, but it's very tough to think in that mindset. 101. Here's Laravel's uh, event dispatcher. Very simple. Event fire. You give it a name of the event, in this case, a user canceled, and then you pass through whatever, the user. Now, we need to listen for that event. So think of event fire uh, as somebody saying, like, hey, so and so happened. But we need to listen for somebody to say that. So, option above, just pass the closure, do whatever you need to do. That's fine for little things, but chances are you'll potentially want to resolve your handler uh, out of the IOC container. Once again, if we resolve it out of the IOC container, you know that behind the scenes, we're using the reflection API. Um, so cool tip there. All right, so now, when a user has canceled, and I like writing my method names this way. I learned this recently, and it really helps me. Because when is a keyword. When you're talking to the company or the business, they will often use that keyword. Well, when such and such happens, then we need to do this. Also, when so and so happens, we need to do that. When is the keyword, and it's usually a telltale sign that it should be represented as an event. Here's another quote from Mafias, excellent developer out uh, in Europe. Using commands and events as the driving force for your model allows you to capture business flows in a way that matches how people think. Once again, notice, matches how people think. We're so focused on CRUD that we forget to make our code match the way actual normal non-developers think. And they don't think in terms of CRUD. But that's very hard to, to switch over. I struggle with it too. OK, so that's just basic Laravel events. But maybe we could take this further. And I'll show you some things I've been learning. OK, so maybe a user cancels. And we will raise an event. And notice how I said when, when a user cancels, we represent that as an event. So we do that, new user has canceled, and then we pass in this. So notice that uh, in this case, what was maybe implicit before, we've now made explicit, which can be useful. So also notice that this doesn't fire the event. So behind the scenes, it's not doing event fire. It's just sort of queuing it. And on that note, like Laravel's, you may not know this, Laravel's event dispatcher, you can queue events and then fire them at a later time. Anyhow. Uh, I didn't create this code snippet. This came from uh, an, another excellent developer called Ross uh, Tuck. 
He is based in Amsterdam. He has a great presentation. It has a really long name. It's something like um, something, something hemoglobin. Definitely watch this presentation. Just YouTube PHP hemoglobin, and it'll make sense. But this is his code snippet, but it's still very, very simple. Raise an event. So we store our pending events on uh, just a simple property here. And then eventually, we need to release these events and dispatch them, right? So we have a little helper method here, get the events, and then clear it out. Pretty simple stuff. And it's stored as a trait so that you can easily use it within your, your eloquent model, your entity, whatever. So now here's what that event might look like. Again, simple data access object. User has canceled, and in this case, I'm passing through our user. Make sure that, well, I'm not going to say make sure because there are no rules. I'm not a big fan of uh, following dogma. But I, I like the practice of naming your events in the past tense because that's how they occurred. So instead of user cancels, no, it already happened. A user has canceled. So that's a good way to represent it. User has canceled. Finally, we need to dispatch the events. And you can whip this up however you want to. So first, uh, within the for each statement, don't worry about this too much. We're basically just kind of preparing the event that we're going to fire. So we take the, the actual class, and we replace the slashes with a dot just to make it feel a little more object-oriented. Then we fire the event. And then finally, debugging events is tough, so we just do a little audit log here. Again, if you're thinking like this is over-engineering, give it five minutes. And also remember, it's not for everything. It's only appropriate if you decide it's appropriate. If it's not, then it's not. It's a tool you will never touch, and that's fine. Uh, and then finally, once again, register your listeners. So before, in our controller, we were just doing that stuff one after another, the old procedural style. But now, when a user is canceled, we want to notify them. And you can register multiple listeners. So when a user cancels, let's do this other thing. And we can have another object for that or another method. It's a nice, clean way to go about it. OK, so that's controllers and events. Let's move on to some other stuff. I told you, you don't have to take all of it in. Just kind of pick up a few things that maybe you can think about. I love testing. So B hat, I think B hat is going to explode this year. The hat 3 just came out. It's already big, but it hasn't had that huge, huge uptake that I think it's going to have this year. So expect it to just go through the roof this year. Better documentation, better framework. More people are talking about it. It's easier to use. Uh, it's a good year for Behat. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, just think of it as a framework. It, it's a framework for testing, but try not to think so much in terms of testing. Once again, it's a framework to help you translate the needs of the business into code. And testing is an excellent side effect of that, but it's not necessarily the only reason you do it. So the way I like to think of it is when you're preparing these features, write it like they say it. And this is hard. We have a, we had this, way of, developers have a way of complicating everything. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So imagine we have this feature here. This is something I actually did for Laracast, verbatim. As a viewer, in order to avoid subscriptions, I want to purchase single lessons. This is an exact feature that I wrote. Right now, people can subscribe for the site, but some people will never do that. And if they want to buy a, a video one-off, this is a way I can represent that. Fine, no problem there. But now, when it comes to writing the scenario, there's a number of ways to do it. Here's what we all kind of do initially. If, you were to, if you've never used this before, by the way, think of a scenario as a way of, of kind of describing how the flow should go. So in this scenario where a user purchases a video, here's how I imagine it going. And then behind the scenes, that gets translated into executable code. So this is how we kind of typically start. Well, given we have a, a, a user, and he's logged in, and there's a lesson, and I'm on slash lessons. What exactly does that mean? And uh, I follow example lesson. Think of that as clicking a link. And then I press this button. Look how, fo look how much it's focused on the UI. Now, if you were to talk, talk to the business or the benefactor, would they say this? If you ask them, like, how do you envision this working, would they say that? and I am on slash lessons. No. What might they say? Well, in the scenario that I'm purchasing a video when I'm logged in, they might say, well, given I'm logged in without a subscription, and there is a lesson, when I go to this lesson and I purchase the video, then I should be able to download it. Very simple. But this is hard. Like, for some reason, we want to do this. 
But this is actually what they want. It's very difficult. I've had a lot of trouble myself trying to get myself to switch from this style of thinking into the way that they think. And this is why it's very important to talk to them and once again translate their needs into the code. It doesn't get more any, any more complex than that. Here's another example. Maybe this is something for like resetting a password. I don't know. Given I'm on slash login and I click this and I fill in that, then I should see this and I should be on that. It's fine, but is that actually what they want? Or is this? Given I have an account, when I reset my password, then I should be emailed password reset instructions. That's much better. So we don't have too much time to go into the hat, but if this is intriguing and you're not using it, and I'm guessing most of you are not using it, think about it. Just play around with it for a little bit, and I think you'll like it. Four minutes left. <sighs> okay, number 10, integration testing with factories. So lots of like, craziness around DHH talking about TDD is dead. He's not saying testing is dead. Please don't think that. He's just saying he doesn't necessarily agree with the idea that unless you do TDD, you're not a respectable and professional developer. Again, that's a whole other discussion that we can maybe have uh, after the conference. But still, you'll find yourself in these situations where maybe, especially if you're using, act, act, I'm sorry, eloquent, but it's the active record pattern. And maybe you want to, like this is an example straight from the Laracast forum. Maybe you want to test some method got get total length. Here's how you might do it. You might like create an album, create a song, you create the world, so to speak. And then we act by calling the method, and then we perform our assertion. So assuming this world, when we do that, what do I expect? What do you think of this? Like, what if the rules for how an album or song is created changes. Well, you'll have to update every test method. And if you extract to a method still, ah, it just gets really complicated. And this is why, ultimately, people just don't do testing at all because it gets complex and they don't want to deal with it and it's not that beneficial in their mind. No, try not to think about that. Instead, how can we make it simpler? I think this is way better than this. So first, notice the method name here. So before we had test get total length. It's fine, but you're just testing the method. What do you, like, does that describe at all what it does? Maybe in your mind, I like to write it much more readably. So that's why I use underscores in this case. I don't think of it specifically as part of like my PHP uh, core code. This is description. And I find that when, when you use camel casing, it encourages you not to actually write out what you expect it to do. We have this, once again, developers have a need to shorten it. We want to make everything succinct. When it's better, just write out exactly what you expect it to do. Now, if you're using something like PHP unit for this, well, you probably know that it needs to be preceded with the, the word test. Well, instead, you can just move that up to a doc block, and this will still work. OK, that's an aside. But in terms of creating the song for the purposes of testing, remember, you don't just create a database and then start running tests. You want to you have the same world for your tests or I'm sorry, every test you run should assume the same world. So if we're touching a database, then we want to create two songs in this case, and each of them should have a length of 300 seconds. Now we can do our act, album first, get total length, or whatever, and uh, finally perform your assertion. This is significantly easier. So now maybe your code looks like this, get total length, get the song's relationship, get the sum of its length field, or if you handle that in a totally different way, it doesn't matter. Because this does not depend upon implementation. And that's sometimes a problem, especially if you're trying to mock things with Eloquent. You end up with like, this should receive this method. And then you find, oh, I'm not really testing anything here. Or my entire test is just making sure that another method is called. And you start thinking, is that that useful? And then I'm dependent upon the implementa implementation details of how that works. It doesn't matter in this case. You can, you can solve it, so to speak, any way you want. OK, once again, whip this up on your own, or there's a package for that. If you do use the package, or you want to whip something like this on your own, very, very simple API. Think, we need a way to, to build up an object. So if we need to build a user, we want a way to do that dynamically. Now, that doesn't save it to the database. If you do, then you can use factory create. And then finally, we need to, some way to override the defaults, like in our case, where we needed to override the length. 
So when, those, when that's appropriate, you can do so. And then finally, we have something like factory times three, and that would create a user three times for the purposes of whatever test you're running. So that's a nice and clean way to go about it. Well, uh, let's see what else. Database transactions, very cool. The package makes use of it. Uh, the basic idea is before the, I'm sorry, after the test, the database will roll back, and this gives you a nice performance boost over running migrate refresh every single time, which, which will add up very, very quickly for a large app. Uh, let's see what else, we're at the end. Gulp is awesome, use it, here's how you use it. Check this out, check how cool that is. Watch it, and then you're done. Uh, it does all of these other cool things. Envoy is awesome, you, you may not use it, it's not required for Laravel, you can use it in vanilla PHP. Use it, here's how you use it, this is what it does, then you deploy it, <laughs> then you can create tasks. Here's all the other cool things it can do. And then finally, <laughs> remember, like I said, all of this stuff, they're little tools that we put in our belt, and you don't have to use every single tool for your project. So don't assume, I learned about repositories, I learned about this other cool thing, so that means if you don't use that for a project, you're unprofessional. No, it just means you're smart enough to know when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. Thank you. <laughs>